Good evening, everyone, and thank you for all uh, for joining us this evening for what is the final instalment in the Brexit lecture series, which is organised by Engineers Ireland. My name is Jeff Mahoney, and I'm the vice chairperson for the Engineers Ireland GB region. Um, before I introduce the three keynote speakers that have kindly offered to support the GB, GB region with their presentation, I would like to ask Morris Buckley, the Engineers Ireland president, to say a few words. Morris? Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, th th that's great. And look, it's lovely to be here this evening just to kick off this lecture. Like you say, the fourth and final lecture in the series on Brexit and its impact on engineering, and in particular, what we in Engineers Ireland can do to help companies in the UK, in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, everywhere, to adapt to the um, new life post-Brexit and how the kind of ground rules have changed, new supply chains, new materials, new relationships between customers and supplier, new, new logistics channels, all of that um, we're, 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 we're trying to deal with. It's a very exciting time and um, really we've had a couple of parallel events going on in Engineering Ireland, just trying to get the profession ready, if you like, or trying to see how we as an organization, professional organization, can support our members as we come out now of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so that happened to coincide with Brexit. So we've got two major impacts on the industry. We've now got a lot of stimulus spending in, in capital uh, and in current by, in the UK, in Ireland, in Europe. Um, and we've got a whole new series of rules of the game uh, as we try and address this. So Engineers Ireland, we're working with the colleges in terms of what uh, um, colleges are offering to graduate engineers or, or undergraduate engineers, I should say, to adapt to the new circumstances. Very much a sustainability focus, very much a management focus that we're trying to, to bring in there. The same thing in terms of our CPD, continuous professional development. Um, trying to use this to, to give practicing engineers the skill set needed in terms of the particular issues around sustainability, digitalization of just about everything, um, and all of the different factors coming into play there. And then we're also working with other professional institutions across Europe, and particularly the UK at the moment, to make sure that no matter what happens at a political level, uh, at a professional engineering level that engineers can work seamlessly across memberships of different bodies and in different jurisdictions um, and that they have the information they need to deal with different issues involved, certifications, uh, all of that. So, so there's been a, a fantastic debate going. This series of four Brexit lectures has been very good and it's offered a very good perspective to uh, our membership. So I'd like to add my thanks to the, the, the three speakers tonight. And I very much look forward to the, the, the talk and the input of the GB region, um, big country, but a, 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 a small region in terms of membership from, in an Engineers Ireland perspective. Um, but a very active membership and a very active committee, and it's great that you could organise this talk tonight. So thank you very much for um, inviting me along, and I look forward to hearing the three speakers. Thank you, Jeff. No problem. Thanks, Morris. Um, so the three speakers, starting with um, Dominic Jones. Dominic is a partner in the construction and planning team at UK law firm Blake Morgan. His team consists of 25 specialists, spread across five offices advising on all stages of construction, engineering, development, and infrastructure projects. Uh, this evening, Dominic will be discussing developments in the construction sector from the perspective of the post-Brexit Great Britain. Lisa Boyd is our next speaker, and Lisa is a director of Belfast law firm Cleaver Fulton Rankin. Lisa heads up the uh, heads up the firm's public procurement team. Her expertise spans across a number of practice areas, including contentious and non-contentious procurement, uh, public procurement, construction, and PPI or PFI projects. Lisa is on the panel this evening to speak on Brexit from the Northern Ireland perspective. <clears throat> and last but not, certainly not least, Sean and Mulryan 
And Shauna is a consultant in the projects and construction team at LK Shields Solicitors in Dublin. Um, LK Shields is a firm of choice for contentious and non-contentious construction matters. Shauna advises both Irish and international clients operating in a broad range of sectors, including renewable energy, healthcare, residential and telecommunications. This evening, Shauna will be discussing the impacts of Brexit on the construction sector from the Irish perspective. Um, and finally, before I move on um, to the speakers, or we move on to the speakers, um, as a handover, I would like to ask the audience to utilize the Q&A uh, chat function at the bottom of your screens to present any questions you might have at the end of the presentation. And they will obviously list themselves out and, and we'll deal with them accordingly and, and move, move down the chain. Again, I'd like to extend my thanks to Dominic, Lisa and Shauna for, for lending their support for this evening and look forward to hearing what you guys have to say. Great, thanks Jeff for those introductions and thanks to Morris for setting the scene so, uh, so aptly. We're delighted to be speaking to you this evening. Um, and my dad is a civil engineer, so he's very glad to know that I'm in such esteemed company. Um, for this discussion, we're going to be using a slightly different format than what you might be used to with lawyers talking to a set of slides. Um, and instead, we're aiming for a bit more dialogue between the three of us uh, as we pick through how the various issues arise and how they're dealt with from the perspectives of GB, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Now, you'll expect a disclaimer from a group of lawyers, and we don't want to disappoint, so uh, I just have to point out this discussion doesn't amount to legal advice, um, and the updates that we're going to touch on today are current as at today's date, which is the 13th of May 2021, for those who are watching a recording. In terms of structure, we're going to start off with a, a brief overview of the new legal framework that we're working in now. Uh, and then look at the changing landscape in three specific areas. Um, labour and resourcing first, then goods and materials, and thirdly, standards and regulation. And as Jeff said, we're aiming to leave some time to take questions at the end. So, legal framework first. Um, and it bears recalling just how much about uh, this legal framework remained uncertain at the end of last year, only a short five months ago. Um, so a no deal breakfast, uh, a no deal Brexit, you'll um, recall was still a very real possibility and that remained a live concern until Christmas Eve. Um, and as a result, there was limited detail really around how businesses operating across UK EU borders would need to operate in practice from the 1st of January this year. Thankfully now, we've got a great deal more clarity on some fronts. But even five months later, I think it's fair to say that there are certain practical issues still being ironed out, especially where there are grace periods in force that mean that formal rules are not yet being enforced. What we can say categorically is that the transition period ended without further extension. And on the 30th of December, 2020, a trade and cooperation agreement was signed between the UK and the EU came into effect the following day. That TCA is essentially a free trade agreement which promises 100% tariff-free and quota-free trade between the two trading blocks. And you may have heard that it, it, it's a lengthy um, piece of text that runs to about 1,200 pages, um, including some dense annexes and protocols. But most relevant out of those provisions for the construction sector are the rules on trade and goods and services. And that agreement does not um, deal with anything beyond trade, really. It doesn't resolve all the complexities of working across borders. And we're going to touch on some of those um, key issues for the UK and Irish construction sectors. There are also some considerations, though, that are specific to the Ireland, Northern Ireland, GB relationship, such as the common travel area, the Northern Ireland protocol. And at that point, I'm going to pass on to Lisa, who's going to pick up on some of those nuances. Uh, thanks, Dominic. Um, as it's been said, I'm here to discuss the Northern Irish aspects of Brexit, which, um, as we go through today, if you don't know already, is a, a bit of a hybrid of the Irish and the GB positions with some quirks thrown in for good measure. 
So first of all, um, the first thing that I was going to flag up was um, basic geography. Um, and it's not to patronise anyone, but it's surprising how many are not aware of basic geography. And um, I think now when um, we're coming to formulate contracts, it's probably becoming even more important. So down to basics, uh, UK means GB plus Northern Ireland. So that includes England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland and GB excludes Northern Ireland as does obviously ROI. So I would just urge anybody who is entering into any agreements to take care in drafting clauses that use phrases such as mainland UK because they don't have any legal definition and will, um, if you use mainland UK, will incorporate Northern Ireland. Moving on then to um, incorporation, um, as you'll see as we go through the, um, the presentation tonight, each jurisdiction has its own uh, nuances and Northern Ireland is certainly in a unique position in terms of its hybrid status and businesses based in GB and Ireland may wish to seek to capitalise on this by having a base in Northern Ireland. Um, specific advices should be sought to ascertain if the benefits can be derived simply from having an incorporated body in Northern Ireland or if a physical presence is also required. And this may differ from company to company. Companies um, may equally benefit from incorporating in Ireland and or G GB. And the same considerations will obviously apply in each of those jurisdictions. In summary, then, companies may find that they benefit from having a company set up in each of the three jurisdictions of Ireland, Northern Ireland and GB if they're going to um, conduct business across the three. Advices, of course, should be sought from a lawyer and um, an accountant as well as um, multi-jurisdictional uh, incorporation will bring benefits. It will also carry some risks and all of these needs to be considered before you take any action. Moving then quickly on to the Northern Ireland um, protocol. Um, some of you may remember that Northern Ireland was used as somewhat of a bargaining chip throughout the Brexit negotiations. It was finally agreed that there would be no uh, new checks on goods crossing the border between Northern Ireland and ROI. Um, attendees tonight may be aware that in recent months that the Northern Ireland protocol has um, caused some friction and issues that now need to be addressed going forward and in order to reach resolution on these issues concessions in other areas may need uh, to be made and that will obviously develop over the next um, next few months. The aims of the protocol were to avoid a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland and maintain the integrity of the EU single market for goods was also to facilitate unfettered access for Northern Irish goods to GB market and the inclusion of NI goods in free trade agreements between UK and third countries. So has that happened? Well, Northern Ireland has left the EU, but has remained in the EU market. It created a new trade border between Northern Ireland and GB. Northern Ireland can benefit from any new UK trade agreement, um, but new paperwork and processes when importing materials and equipment from GB has created some difficulties, which we'll touch on later on. Interestingly, um, Manufacturing NI surveyed 190 com companies in April of this year and found that GB suppliers were unprepared or unwilling to adopt Brexit regulations um, are the largest issues that firms are currently facing. So as we'll go on to explain, some of the barriers to date appear to be due to confusion as to the correct processes, and hopefully we'll be able to signpost you to the things that you need to consider. Brexit and the Northern Ireland Protocol presents a unique challenge and opportunity to every business in the UK and Ireland, and more particularly those businesses who trade across uh, the jurisdictions. So I'm going to um, hand over now to Shauna, who's going to um, chat about the ROI context. That's great. Thank you, Lisa. Um, yeah, I suppose first and foremost, from an Irish point of view, um, the new arrangements, uh, as Lisa just mentioned there, avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland. The TCA effectively ensures a single market for goods on the island. And this is of critical importance for the all island economy generally and in particular for construction. 
Um, in a report in 2019, the CIF reported that its members believed the cost of doing business in Ireland would increase by 5 to 10 percent in the event of a new deal Brexit. In reality, and e even with a deal in place, the cost increase has actually proven to be to be to be significantly greater. Um, although I suppose um, that that's not least as a result of the new customs and regulatory regime. The pandemic obviously is also impacting greatly uh, on, on the availability of supplies of, of construction goods and materials. The Irish construction industry has been acutely aware of the risks posed by Brexit uh, and, ha and has been taking action in, in no small measure uh, due to the to excellent work of organisations um, such as our host this evening, Engineers Ireland, and, and Morris has, has just referred to some of, uh, uh, some of the, the, the great initiatives um, that have been undertaken. Uh, that being said, there are still significant challenges and hurdles to overcome, particularly from um, an East-West GB Ireland trading perspective and in terms of bringing UK suppliers and contractors up to speed on the requirements as they relate to Ireland. And we'll, we'll get into a bit more detail on those. Uh, I, I suppose it's really, really important. And, and just to put it in context, um, according to the Department of Housing in Ireland, 40% of all construction products which are used in Irish pro projects come from or through the UK. Um, and uh, as I said, we'll, we'll look at that in a bit more detail uh, shortly. So that, that's just an overview of the legal framework and, and the context. Um, so perhaps now, uh, Dominic, we can start, start looking at, at some of those um, uh, impacts in, uh, in a bit more detail. And I think the first one, um, that, that we mentioned was uh, labour and, and resourcing issues. So we're going to hand you over now to Dominic. Yeah, thank you, John. I'll, I'll pick up, kick off with uh, labour and resourcing, and then hand on to, to others as we as we work through. Um, so the first point to make is that um, as regards free movement of people, that has now ended for GB. Um, meaning that subject to certain caveats, the immigration rules of the UK and the EU apply to one another in the same way as they do to third countries. Um, and that arises against the backdrop of structural issues, skills shortages and ageing workforce, and those are points that have afflicted the UK construction industry for, for years. Um, and there are various causes of those issues, various initiatives intended to address them. Um, but one sticking plaster that has helped to plug some of that skills gap um, has been the ability to rely on recruits from EU countries. And there are now signs that just not enough has been done to avoid a, a feared cliff edge. So it's important for business to understand the rules that now apply to their workforces. And to put that into, into numbers, uh, research from the University of Oxford suggests that 46% of EU national skilled workers may have left the UK um, construction sector during the transition period. And while figures for unskilled labour vary by region, the 2018 ONS Office of National Statistics figures showed that approximately a third of construction workers in London were nationals of EU 27 states. So it's a significant shift of the, of the, the goalposts. Looking at the new state of play in general terms, and we'll come to the specific situation of Ireland in a moment, um, for EU workers moving to the UK for the first time after the 1st of January 2021, the UK's points-based immigration system now applies to them in the same way as for any other non-UK worker. So they'll need a, a work visa and employer sponsorship. And that system involves minimum skills thresholds. So UK companies no longer have unlimited access to EU labourers to fill lower skilled roles. The skills thresholds that I mentioned have been reduced. So while structural engineers have always been eligible for sponsorship under that system, uh, a case may now be made to support other consultants and specialist trades, forming carpenters, welders, electricians, for instance. And the annual cap on, spill, on skilled workers entering the UK has also been suspended for the time being. For EU nationals who already lived in the UK on the 31st of December 2020, the EU settlement scheme will apply. And that scheme continues to accept applications until the end of next month, until the 30th of June 
2021. Under that scheme, those who have lived in the UK for at least five years will be eligible for settled status, essentially permanent residency, uh, and those who have lived here for less than five years will be entitled to what's known as pre-settled status, and that can be converted into settled status once the five-year residency requirement has been fulfilled. But it's important to say that uh, Irish nationals do not need to apply for settled or pre-settled status via that EU settlement scheme. The, the common travel area, which encompasses GB and the island of Ireland, predates the EU and has been reaffirmed in a memorandum of understanding signed in May 2019 to enable Irish and British nationals to move seamlessly between the two countries. Lisa, I think you're going to add a few thoughts on the, the CTA and indeed the end of free movement more generally. Yeah, um, and you've covered it very thoroughly there, um, Dominic, but I just wanted to add that really um, Northern Ireland um, remains part of the UK and therefore the free mo movement of people won't be um, affected from Northern Ireland to GB or vice versa. In terms of the common travel area, um, this obviously predates EU membership and is not dependent upon upon it. So Irish and British citizens will be able to avail of the common travel area and therefore not need a permit in order to work on either side of the border. Northern Ireland and Ireland have a long standing history of people crossing the border to work on a daily basis and this um, can obviously continue. And in the construction industry, this is um, very important um, because um, there are a huge amount of construction workers that move both sides of the border on a daily basis. So um, that can continue. So uh, Sean, I think you're gonna talk about the implications for the labor market. All right, just, um, yeah, thank, thanks, Lisa. Yeah, um, I just wanted to, to briefly add, just in, in relation to the, to the common travel area as well, um, the withdrawal agreement and the TCA expressly provides for the right of uh, Republic of Ireland and the UK to make their own arrangements as it relates to the, C to the CTA. Um, the main legislation in Ireland that deals with this is the withdrawal of of the UK from, from the European Union Consequential Provisions Act 2020, which was enacted in Ireland in December 2020. So that legislation amends the Immigration Act 2004 so that UK citizens do not come within the definition of non-nationals for the purposes of that legislation. Um, it also amends the Employment, Employment Permit Act 2006 such that UK citizens are included in an Irish company's EEA employee count for the purposes of making up the 50% EEA employee count for companies in order uh, for, for employment permits to issue. So it's hoped that this will actually be of assistance in, in, in particular in terms of cross-border partnerships in the context of, of public procurement in the future. So broadly speaking, as Lisa and Dominic have, have outlined, the UK and the EU have committed to a level playing field for open and fair competition in relation to their labour markets. But if the common travel area still exists, what are the implications for Ireland uh, of, of the UK ending free movement? Uh, so, so many Irish and UK projects depend on construction workers and expertise from within the EU. Uh, now that Brexit has happened, these non-Irish EU citizens, other than those who have registered for settled status, as, as Dominic was uh, referring to earlier, um, are, are not, not going to be able to work in the UK now without going through certain immigration processes. Um, so, so it's, it's arguable uh, um, that, that there's potentially now a larger pool of talent and resource within the EU, which Ireland can tap into. Um, that this will go a long way towards delivering uh, Project Ireland 2040, which is the, the Irish government's 116 billion plan to deliver major infrastructure over the next 20 years. So it, it's creating many thousands of vacancies for jobs and, uh, and, and apprenticeships to help deliver these goals um, that can, can, can now be filled by skilled EU workers. 
Um, Ireland's expertise is known globally, but we do have shortages of resources in key areas. So to a certain extent, the UK's loss of EU, EU workers here is, is potentially Ireland's gain. Um, Dominic, I know I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about mutual recognition of, of qualifications here as well, but I think now is maybe a good, good point for you to, to jump in on that. Yeah, thanks, Sean. I'll, I'll um, make a few comments and then pass on to you. I, I guess the key, the key point is that from the 1st of January this year, the EU directive on the mutual recognition of qualifications no longer applies to the UK, one of the other consequences of Brexit. So that means that qualifications gained in an EU country will now need to be recognised by the equivalent UK regulator. Although qualifications recognised before Brexit will continue to be valid. That's an important point to note. Um, but the consequence is that some professional services firms are having to consider fundamental changes to their business models. Uh, an example is the UK architectural practice behind the Pompidou Centre in Paris, uh, which had previously served its EU clients from London, has now decided to set up a Paris office as a gateway to Europe. Now, the expressed intention of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement is to avoid the need for companies to establish that local presence in order to continue doing business. It, it may be um, beneficial for other reasons, as, uh, as Lisa alluded to, but that's the intention of the TCA. What we're seeing is that in reality, things are turning out to be more complicated um, due to perfect potential issues with recognition of qualifications on one side, insurance arrangements as well. Um, and there's a sense that EU clients are just more cautious about employing UK-based professionals. Um, but Sean, I was going to pass on to you because I think there's some better news that we can share with Irish and UK construction professionals. Yeah, yes, thanks. Thanks, Dominic. And um, yeah, and actually we'll see how that's the case also uh, with respect to the services issue and how the TCA deals with that. Um, so, so yeah, as, as you said, the EU Directive on Professional Qualifications no longer applies. Um, since January 2021, mutual recognition ended and those getting UK qualifications in the future may need to get their qualification recognised in Ireland. Um, the good news is, is that it doesn't affect you if you've had a, a UK qualification recognised in Ireland before the 31st of December 2020 and that includes applications that were in the process of being recognised. Um, so potentially it's it's going to be more of an issue for professionals who are working towards getting their qualifications. Um, and in that regard, certainly each regulated profession is working, uh, working to make the process of mutual recognition as painless as possible. Um, I, th I think Engineers Ireland can be commended in their efforts in this regard um, and for having been on the ball uh, in supporting professional mobility of engineers. Um, and I'm sure most of you are, are, are aware in 2018, Engineers Ireland signed a, a, an agreement which is known as the Access Pathways Agreement um, with its counterpart in the UK, the Engineers Council, uh, to, to facilitate mobility of engineering professionals through um, a streamlined professional registration membership uh, process. Um, that agreement effectively ensures that um, engineers who apply, uh, who are assessed and achieve a registered professional title from Engineers Ireland will continue to have that uh, registered title recognised if they seek work in the UK um, and correspondingly engineers in the UK who receive a professional title from, from one of um, their professional engineering institutions will have that title recognised if they wish to come to work in, in the Republic of Ireland. Um, so, so where it relates to services, I'm thinking more your independent engineer cost consultant or QS, someone like that who makes a regular trip over to Ireland, um, uh, of which there are many. Uh, where, where do you sit in terms of services and the legal requirements around that is is there a requirement to have a, a, a physical presence in in the relevant state um I, I think it's probably fair to say that the tca uh, does not cover services to any great extent um having the ability to sell services into individual member states really 
depends on the rules of that of each of those states. Um, there, there are detailed reservations, though, uh, that they do vary, however, from country to country and, and uh, by sector. Um, for example, as lawyers, uh, a UK provider seeking to provide legal advice in Ireland would have to have uh, a, a commercial physical presence in Ireland. Um, and that's actually that's set out in an express reservation in the TCA. Uh, the good news is, however, for the construction sector, um, the reservations around that are more generous. Um, access to the Irish construction mar market is actually is dealt with in reservation number eight. Um, and in that reservation, access is described as unbound for construction and engineering services between the UK and Ireland. There are, however, some sectors within that that do require an economics needs test uh, to, be, to be carried out. Um, that includes telecoms, railroad and transport related services, but by and large access is unbinded, um, which is really good news for, for the construction industry, for con construction companies uh, and, and professionals trying to get into to the Irish market. Um, so, so I suppose generally the TCA do, doesn't really go beyond preserving the levels of access that were previously enjoyed by businesses in, in the construction sector. Um, Lisa, Dominic, I, I don't know if, if, there's, if you'd like to add anything there just in terms of consequences for, for businesses operating in the UK. Or, yeah. yeah, I'll just jump in quickly to say I think I think the key message for those operating in the UK is be prepared and act early that means things like checking applications for settled and pre-settled status for EU um, workers are, are, are in mindful that the deadline is approaching fast 30th of June this year um, and made the point about reviewing relevant professional accreditations making sure that people working have got uh, accreditations qualifications recognized um, by the, the relevant bodies. Um, and then from July onwards, that points-based immigration system will apply to, to EU um, migrants, EU workers. Um, and it's just worth noting that uh, the budget announcement in March of this year promised some, some changes to simplify uh, the migration policy around highly skilled workers to make it easier to use. And there's a roadmap that's due to be published in the summer with an elite points-based visa that's expected to be introduced by um, March 2022. Um, Lisa, I'm not sure if you had anything to add before Shauna picks up. Yeah, um, really the position in Northern Ireland is the same and I think all we can do is emphasise that um, impending deadline for everybody and to make sure that everybody identifies any workers within um, the businesses and make sure that uh, that deadline is met. Um, other than that, unless um, either of you have anything to say, I think that probably ends our section on labour and resourcing. And um, Shona, I think you're going to pick up on goods and materials. Yeah, that's great. Thank, thanks, Lisa. Um, yeah, so just, just to look at the area of the movement of goods between UK and the EU, uh, while the TCA creates a free trading area uh, under the TCA terms with zero tariffs and quotas, the situation will still be very different compared to the frictionless trade that was enabled by the EU's customs union and single market. So goods now imported into Ireland from Great Britain are they're subject now to, to customs processes. Uh, and in preparing for this, the, the revenue in Ireland have really emphasized uh, to business the need to get um, an economic operator's registration identification number or EORI uh, for short. Uh, once that number is obtained, um, it, it, it's, it's used as a common reference for interacting with customs authorities across the EU and member states. Um, take up has been successful. Uh, as of September last year, more than 67,000 businesses had, had registered for an EOR, EORI. Um, yeah, so so traders will need an, an EORI number if if well if your business is um, is going to be making customs declarations or getting a, a customs um, decision in Ireland. 
I think a lot of the holdup and delays that, that we're seeing were reported uh, at ports has been as a result of these, this, these issues. And I suppose the fact that perhaps importers are not prepared or not fully aware of, of, of the extent of the new requirements. So um, I guess if, you're, if you are a UK company with operations in Ireland or you're seeking to do business in Ireland in, in the future, um, it's important that you investigate this process and, and get registered as soon as possible. Um, application for, for an EORI is, is, can be done through the revenue website. Um, in, in reality, what, what we're seeing on the ground is that once businesses have their EORI uh, number, much of the customs work has actually been outsourced to third party providers. Um, uh, and, and would re recommend that um, companies also take tax advice on, on, on these matters in any event. Um, Dominic, uh, Lisa, maybe you have something to, to add there just on the goods and materials? Briefly, just on ERIs, if you're, and I'm not sure how relevant this is to, uh, to the audience tonight, but if you are uh, a GB based importer or exporter, then and I'd say check that your EORI -E -O -R -I number starts with GB. Um, uh, and you may also, I think Lisa might explain this in a, a, a bit more clearly, you might also need one beginning with XI if you, if you move uh, goods to or from Northern Ireland. Um, and the process in GB was perhaps less successful than what Sean has described in Ireland. Um, I think that what happened was uh, the revenue service, HMRC, issued uh, those GB prefix EORI numbers to all businesses that it thought were going to need one um, a couple of years ago, back in 2019. But the process they followed meant that they missed out about 100,000 companies that are not that registered. Um, and purpose of flagging that is if you are a GB based importer or exporter and you don't have that number, um, you're going to need to apply for one. Lisa, I think there's a hybrid situation in, in NI. Yeah, yeah. Why, why do things your own way when you can steal two ideas? Um, so yeah, there, there's a bit of a hybrid um, going on in Northern Ireland. So goods and materials moving strictly between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland or the EU don't require any declarations. If you're bringing goods into Northern Ireland from GB, there are two, um, two types of goods. There are those goods not at risk of leaving the UK and they're tariff free and goods at risk of entering the EU single market will be subject to tariffs. So there are a number of options to avoid um, those tariffs if they're, if they're not applicable. So there's preferential duty rate under the TCA. Um, you can be authorised as not being at risk under the UK trader scheme and you can claim a waiver of up to specified limits. So that trader support scheme helps businesses navigate the changes for moving goods between Northern Ireland and GB and provides that authorisation for those goods that are not at risk. Goods from Northern Ireland to GB are currently moving freely, provided that they're not at risk of leaving the UK. Um, goods into Northern Ireland from outside the UK and the EU are subject to UK duty if they're not at risk to move to the EU. So um, plenty of different uh, combinations to try and get your head around. Um, and um, if you're subject to those, you're probably already trying to grapple with those issues. Um, I think... Um, Dominic, um, you have um, some anecdotes of uh, things that you've come across in practice. Yeah, uh, thanks, um, Lisa. I was just going to comment briefly on the fact that, notwithstanding this expectation of frictionless trade, there are real and growing concerns of the delays at the borders due to the additional red tape that Shauna mentioned at the start of this section, uh, and that is leading to increased prices. Um, so, for instance, uh, I've read recently that prices for roofing and timber products into the GB market have, uh, have risen by 20% uh, and steel price hikes are, are in the order of 40%. Now, steel shortages are a bit of a perennial issue, but the current problem seems to be particularly acute. And I read this week that um, British Steel has temporarily closed its order book due to extreme demand and capacity constraints. Um, this seems at least in part to arise due to a lack of availability of shipping containers um, with certain carriers being reluctant to take bookings for the UK due to congestion at UK ports and that's a, a real 
a particular issue when there's healthy demand elsewhere as economic activity rebounds globally. Um, so just anecdotally, it's, it's as a result of that that some projects are having to reassess uh, the approach to programming. I've heard of some cases where people are considering moving away from just-in-time deliveries for certain items that have got lead times that, uh, that are more difficult to plan for. Um, Sean, have you got anything to add on that or, or something on uh, ATC Carnets to add at this point? Yeah, yeah. Th thanks, Dominic. Yeah, I, um, all I was going to mention um, was that there's a huge amount of um, construction uh, UK contractors and subcontractors doing business in Ireland, um, traveling back and back and forth on the ferry. Um, what are the issues for them uh, in terms of bringing their plant and machinery across uh, in, in order to avoid going through customs processes in relation to a contractor's plant machinery or tools um, that that contractor may be required to complete uh, what's called an ATA carne, uh, which is a, a form which effectively allows the contractor's plant uh, and, and or tools to be temporarily taken in uh, and out of the EU for certain specific purposes. So it's an additional layer of complexity for the industry. There are longer term solutions, and I know that some larger GB contractors have actually incorporated in Ireland just to get around this issue. Uh, who, who knows, it may also have a positive impact on the plant hire sector in Ireland remains to be seen really, uh, and I guess time will tell. Um, I also just wanted to, to mention a point, um, I suppose where, where we've really seen this issue regarding um, goods and materials crystallizing in, in the earlier days as, as construction lawyers uh, has been in, in the construction contracts. Uh, we've, we've seen the introduction of Brexit clauses uh, as, as in construction contracts as early as 2018. Uh, concerns of, of delays were, were arising as early as that um, and, and I suppose those, those clauses have become more refined over time. Um, fr from a legal and contractual standpoint, apportionment of risk has, has been dealt with primarily through the contractual mechanisms. Um, such clauses typically operate downstream, so that's to say that an, an employer will tend to transfer the risk for construction uh, delays and, and cost increases in materials and, and circumstances arising as a result of Brexit to the contractor. Uh, so I suppose a, a contractor that, that, that's subject to one of these clauses and to that risk would, would be wise to back, back to back that risk in, in any subcontracts that they have or uh, cover off the risk in, in contracts with suppliers to the extent that they can and just to avoid getting unnecessarily exposed to to those risks um dominic we i think you were going to maybe say something just about rules of origin in in the context of the tca yes thank you Donna. just on brexit clauses actually i guess um it's probably in case this is relevant to engineers who might carry out a certifier role under main contract so i have to engage with those provisions or comment on them and um, the there, there might be in GB at least, uh, um, a bit of movement in relation to market practice on those clauses. I, I think you're, the position for a long time was absolutely as, as you've described it here as well. Um, and uh, contractors were expected to take um, time risk and, and cost risk um, and, and employers were able to insist on that. But since we've got a deal, um, uh, uh, well, sorry, since, since the, these, the realities of, of what this deal actually means and, and the frictionless trade uh, not looking quite so, so simple, um, some more collaborative employers have been prepared to engage in negotiations a little bit more. And I wouldn't say there's anything that could be called a, a firm market position emerging yet, but scope for discussion, I'd say, is, uh, is, a, a, is more evident than it, than it was for a long time. Um, rules of origin, that's what I was meant to move on to. Um, yeah, so the essence of this point is that it, it's a corollary of eliminating customs duties in a free trade agreement. Um, that potent, that uh, preferential tariff treatment that you get only applies to goods uh, that originate in the participant trading blocks. Otherwise, that arrangement can distort 
competition by allowing items from third countries into that uh, free um, tariff area. Uh, and what, what it means is that businesses seeking to move goods between the UK and the EU that would normally attract a customs duty under the UK global tariff or the EU common customs tariff, they'll need to determine whether their products meet the, uh, the rules of origin set out in the TCA. So exporters will need to classify their goods, establish the origin rule applicable under the TCA, uh, and, and develop origin determination, calculation, certification, and record keeping processes. There's a lot of, lot of admin there. Importers um, will need to check that the uh, exporting suppliers understand those rules, uh, they'll need to uh, obtain evidence to support those origin qualifications of the products. And they'll need to understand how they, they claim the preference at import and instruct their customs brokers accordingly. And also keep records again, um, just for when the, the auditors may come knocking. Now it's a, it's a complex regime. Um, there are detailed rules regarding tolerances where products manufactured in the UK or the EU uh, comprise components from third countries. So to give an example, and this is just one instance, um, originating status is generally not lost if non-originating materials carry a value below 10% of the X works price of the product. Um, and there are also complications for supply chain arrangements introduced by, these, uh, by, by the rules, particularly the rules on processing. And those set out what does and does not amount to sufficient production to enable a product to acquire and retain originating status. Um, and that's all legal jargon, but an interesting case point uh, that helps to illustrate this is the example of uh, the Marks and Spencer's Percy Pig Sweets. Now those are manufactured in Germany, then shipped to the UK, they're stored here, and then exported onwards to Ireland. That's the supply chain. At the point that they, uh, they reach Ireland, even though those goods started their life off in Germany, um, they're effectively being exported back into the EU, which means that they could attract tariffs because storage in the UK does not qualify as sufficient production. And so the sweets do not originate within the UK and don't benefit from that rule of origin. Now, those sorts of loopholes and concerns mean that suppliers and buyers need to be looking at their supply chain arrangements really carefully and just considering whether the routing, processing, warehousing options could be better aligned with the new rules. Um, and the position is complicated further by the fact that the rules and tariffs are product specific. So I've heard that in some cases, suppliers are just choosing to pay the tariff because the costs of doing that are actually lower than putting in place the administrative processes to demonstrate origination and benefit from um, the, the, the tariff relief. Shauna, is there anything you wanted to add on rules of origin from the Irish point of view? Yeah, yeah, no, that, 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 that's all really interesting, what, what you say there, Dominic. Um, just, I suppose, from an Irish perspective, if you are claiming that the goods you are importing from the UK attract no duty, you, you, you have to actually make that claim through revenue. It's not an automatic no duty scenario. So um, importers have to establish to the revenue to its satisfaction that the point of origin of, of the product is, is in fact um, the UK. Uh, so additional logistical issues there for, for those importing or exporting to or from the UK. Uh, the, process of establishing um, origin to revenue is, is, is quite complex um, and it does need to be taken into account. Uh, I, I, I suppose there, there will obviously be an increase in costs with those new administrative burdens and undoubtedly we'll see that they're, they're passed on to the ultimate consumer. Um, I think uh, I, th I think the I think we're on to the last section, maybe the, the last area, Dominic, that, that we said we, we'd look at this evening. So um, I, I'll just move on to that, which was uh, standards and regulations. Um, it's a complex area in terms of Brexit issues, uh, the, in, in terms of regulation of construction products. The law in Ireland has not changed. 
uh, if you are going to place a product on the market in an EU state, then it must comply with the construction products regulations. Um, the principal legislation in Ireland is the European Union Construction Products Regulations 2013, um, and that transposes the EU CPR directive. The a CPR requires every product to be used in a construction project or which otherwise qualifies as a construction product, it must have a declaration of performance and the well-known CE marking. So third bodies called notified bodies assess products and provide certificates of conformity. And crucially, notified bodies must be registered in an EU country. So UK notified bodies lost their status after Brexit. So any products previously certified with the UK notified body will need to be retested uh, and, and recertified with an EU notified body. If this, if this isn't done, uh, the materials cannot be lawfully used on Irish pro pro projects. I, th I think it's worth, uh, it, it's important to consider also compliance with standards and regulations as an issue under the contract with the employer, the designer assigned certifier. Uh, and, a, and a key point here from an Irish perspective is that the effect of Brexit with regards certification of, of products does not, does not undermine a British standard or affect its validity. So when a designer selects a British standard, they are saying that is how they want an element of the building or project to perform. So the validity of that standard as a benchmark is it, it, it's unaffected. Clearly, however, the Irish, Irish building regulations will still apply, uh, and except where EU law requires an EU harmonised standard, an example here would be um, waste disposal. Uh, in that case, the EU standard must, must also be met. Dominic, I think maybe you were going to jump in there uh, and talk about GB standards. Yeah, because unfortunately, as of the 31st of December last year, um, we've got a different set of rules now because the EU construction product regulation um, um, ceased to apply. So from the 1st of January, a new new rules apply. Um, and uh, that's England, Wales and Scotland. I think Lisa will comment on the, uh, the position in Northern Ireland, where they've got to um, match EU requirements uh, more closely. Um, but in GB, the, the intention is to avoid disruption to the circulation of construction products. So all day one UK designated standards are identical to the harmonised European standards that they replaced. Uh, and there's no change in marking or certification required for products that were placed on the market before the new regulation came into force. But going forwards, um, new GB standards will be set by statutory instruments. Um, and conformity assessment activity for UK designated standards will be undertaken by new UK uh, approved bodies. Um, and uh, there's a new UK conformity assessment or UK CA mark uh, that's come into effect for products placed on the market in, uh, in GB and a UK NI indication, um, which is used with other marks. And uh, Lisa will explain that. Um, so there's a transition period until the end of this year, during which the CE mark can continue to be used, provided the relevant standards do remain aligned during that period. Um, but well-advised businesses are, are taking steps now to make sure that they're prepared to use those UKCA and uh, UKNI marks in good time ahead of 1 January 2022. Um, and yeah, it's worth noting that although a lot of that, those technicalities um, really apply to imp uh, for importers to, to comply with. Um, as, as Shauna says, um, those who specify um, construction products, including engineers, um, do need to understand which requirements apply, which requirements are set out in the contract um, so that they can ensure that uh, they're using safe materials, but also um, that they're complying with contractual obligations, deleterious materials, provisions, and the like. Um, just a couple of further thoughts. First, although we're starting off with 
um, this alignment between UK and EU standards and an intention to maintain consistency. There is a chance of divergence in some areas as new standards are introduced or updated. Um, and, and second, there's no mutual recognition of standards and testings. Um, so UK, uh, it's left to the individual approved bodies to decide whether or not to accept EU um, issued test reports uh, to enable UKCA marking. Um, but that that is possible, whereas as Sean says in Ireland, um, UK approved body um, certificates won't be recognised, they have to be a, a separate testing process carried out. And um, on a related point, just finally, um, we had a question ahead of this webinar about what Brexit means for Euro codes. Uh, and in short, um, <laughs> the answer is that it, it will fall to the British standards body, BSI, in, in GB, in UK, to determine equivalent standards going forwards. But for the time being, the BSI has extended its membership of the European standards bodies, CEN and CENELEC, until the end of this year, effectively extending the transitional period. Um, after then, we've got a pretty strong indication that BSI intends to maintain a consistent approach to construction safety standards and to avoid divergence from Euro codes and Euro norms. Um, so it seems likely that core requirements will stay aligned, but there is potential um, for the UK to take a different regulatory approach where BSI or, or the government can be persuaded that there's a benefit in doing so. So I'm afraid that on that point, it's another, it's another watch this space um, comment, I'm afraid. Um, Lisa, Sean, anything to add from your respective perspectives? Yeah, just on, just on the UK NI mark, um, as you said, as long as the NI protocols in force, um, Northern Ireland will align uh, with the EU rules in respect to placing um, products are on the market. Um, so the conformity market uh, markings have to show that your products meet the rules. So the UK NI uh, marking is the new conformity marketing for products placed uh, on the market in Northern Ireland where a UK assessment body has been used, but um, it's important to note that they're never uh, that marking will never be used on its own. So either it will be the CE marking if it's an EU conformity assessment board body or the CE and UK NI marking if a UK body has done that assessment. Um, if the products are being placed um, in on the market in the EU, the UK NI marking will not be uh, recognised and so it's only the CE marking that um, will be used and it'll be used on its own. Um, I'm not sure if either of you want to um, have any other thoughts. Um, I'm just conscious of time and Jess probably <laughs> wanting to field a few questions too. Yeah, I, I agree. Maybe maybe we should. So I think um, unless or was Sean going to touch on Siri? Um, otherwise, maybe we, we wrap up and hand on to, to Jeff to see if he can squeeze a question in the next two minutes. Yeah, uh, yeah no, I, 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 I'm happy to, to, to just talk uh, quickly, just touch on, on Siri. Um, uh, I suppose it's 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 not strictly a Brexit point, but uh, a lot has has been made um, of the construction industry register in Ireland. Um, it's currently a, a voluntary register. Uh, it's supported by government and it consists of a list of competent builders. So um, uh, as part of the registration process, applicants need to demonstrate minimum experience and knowledge and understanding of Irish construction standards as well as minimum technical competencies. Um, as I say, it's not really a Brexit point, but Momentum does um, remain to put this register on a statutory and mandatory footing. So I suppose for UK construction companies who are doing business in Ireland or perhaps like in Ireland in the future, would be well advised to explore that process for for getting registered with with Siri as soon as possible. So, um, Jeff, I'll, ha I'll hand it over to you now um, for a bit of a bit of Q and A if we if we have some time. Thank you. Yeah, we we'll, we'll make a few time. There's there is um, we have four questions on, so we will um, we'll start first and foremost with um, two questions from Con Keller. The first one. Being, can you advise if Brexit has had an impact on public procurement? 
Yeah, I'll maybe jump in first on that and then um, guys can jump in if there's anything else to add. In the UK, there are going to be changes to the procurement regime post, uh, post Brexit. Um, and this was mentioned in the Queen's speech earlier this week. Um, it's going to simplify the rules and embed transparency throughout the whole commercial life cycle from planning to, um, to the procurement, taking it through. Um, the green paper was published earlier this year and um, I was part of um, a consultation um, group for the Procurement Lawyers Association and presented to the Cabinet Office on that. So there was lots of uh, thoughts put forward on how some of the ideas will work and maybe some that uh, need a little more thought. Currently, the position is that um, contracts will no longer be advertised on OGU and in the UK you need to look at Contracts Finder and in Northern Ireland um, you need to be uh, registered on eTenders NI and look on the local council websites and CPD websites so it's important for anybody who is involved in public sector work to make sure that they're registered on those new um, subscription services to make sure that they're not missing out on any tenders. Um, many policy considerations are within that new procurement consultation paper. Um, there's there's uh, a thought that instead of having three sets of regulations, we'll go to one. Um, the processes are going to change. Um, so that will be new processes for everybody who's probably just got used to the old, the, the, the old processes. Um, cap on damages for any claims. Um, possible introduction of procurement tribunals. Um, and centralization of items such as disputes and uh, debarment, so um, and pre-registration processes as well. So the, it, it looks like there's going to be a real shakeup of the public procurement um, regulations. And obviously that's going to be within the sort of uh, global agreements that um, the UK are signed up to. And there's certain things that still need to remain that will align in some ways with the EU. But I think over the next couple of years that um, everybody involved in procurement is going to see a few changes. So I don't know if the, the other guys have anything they want to add to that. Yeah, Lee, thanks, Lisa. I might jump in there um, just from an Irish um, point of view. The, the situation with regards to procurement is largely preserved. Um, the UK acceded to the government procurement agreement upon expiry of the transitional period on, on the 31st of December uh, 2020. Um, and under the European Union Award of Public Authority Contracts Regulations 2016, um, contracting authorities in Ireland are bound to treat economic operators covered by the GPA no less favourably um, than, than the treatment afforded to economic operators uh, within the EU. So it's all very positive, but I, I suppose you have to remember that in reality, um, those companies involved in tendering for, for public projects will face all, all of the commercial challenges um, as any other company coming uh, to, to do business in Ireland um, and, and I guess that covers all the range of, of challenges that we've just discussed um, we've, we've discussed this evening uh, so I, I think I think I think we've answered okay we've answered that one hope thanks very much Lisa and Sean um, just the second one then from Con Keller he asks does Brexit and Covid present any opportunities in relation to capital spend on projects? So I'll pick that one up first. Um, well, th there's been a, a lot of rhetoric around um, UK government's ambition for the construction sector to lead the economic recovery post-COVID, post-Brexit. Um, you've heard the slogans, build back better, greener, faster. Um, I think also the experience of COVID has accelerated certain trends like the, uh, the uptake of offsite manufacture, digital construction tools, and there's, there's a reinvigorated emphasis on sustainable net zero carbon buildings. Um, there's there's a encouraging signs, I'd say, in the market at the moment um, of a resurgence in activity. I saw a chart the other day that almost looked like the the V-shaped recovery that we were promised at one stage. Um, and I think partly that's down to the success of the vaccination program. Um, but as was mentioned at the very outset, there have been a number of stimulus 
announcements, including uh, in the budget back in March and in the Queen's speech earlier this week, um, announcing things like uh, the National Infrastructure Bank, designation of free ports, um, uh, R&D tax breaks, a task force on modern methods of construction, there's some simplification of some parts of the, the planning system. Um, so in short, I'd, I'd say lots of opportunity, um, but probably remains to be seen how quickly the, the money that's been promised by government will start to flow, how it will be allocated. Um, and there's always a risk, isn't there? There's always a but when you're talking to a lawyer. Um, there's that growing sense that unless uh, the current issues with material shortages can be addressed pretty swiftly, that could really hamstring the sector's ability to take advantage of these opportunities that, that are available. Thanks very much, Dominic. The, uh, Frank Given is asking the panel the question that if a non-Irish EU citizen working in Ireland needs to work in Northern Ireland for an extended assignment, how will the new Im immigration rules impact that transfer? Um, yeah, I'll maybe pick up on that one quickly. Um, I'm not sure if that question was put up um, maybe before we, we, we touched on that section. So um, hopefully that has been covered, but um, obviously there's going to be the post the um, post the 30th of June, um, if, if you haven't applied for settled um, status, then there's going to be the yeah. immigration point system. So um, that, that will be the, the system. That yeah. will... And Norbert Ellenberger has asked, how is the situation for EU or Irish engineers providing freelance engineering services in the UK after, um, after June of this year? Are there any precautions that need to be taken? for those type of, um, I suppose, one-off uh, freelance limited company entities? I guess that's similar, isn't it, to what you've what you just said, Lisa, say that if, if you're talking about an Irish engineer in the UK, you've got the common travel area. Um, so um, that should take you outside of those, those new um, rules. But for, for an EU national, um uh it, it's what lisa's just said or I, I think in this in this um there's anything specific that lisa or shauna would add to that no i think i, I think that's i i think i yeah. think nor norbert you should be more worried about the impact of hmrc and ir35 and the um the change in landscape for for contractors uh, that that's uh, that's more of a concern i think than than uh the movement of people. Moving on, and the, the last question we have, I'm conscious of time, uh, Keith Elliott, he, he says, I understand that there is a significant and worsening shortage of truck drivers in the, U in the UK due to the European drivers being unable or unwilling to work in the UK. Does the panel think that in um, this is an issue that is likely to impact construction companies working across the UK and Ireland uh, who routinely move material and equipment between the two jurisdictions. Gosh, well, I, I hadn't heard of that, but it can't help, can it? If, you, if <laughs> We've already got issues um, with uh, blockages at ports and uh, you know, problems with additional red tape that weren't anticipated. Um, and if the if the supply chain is uh, hamstrung even further because you haven't got people to drive the trucks, um, that's that yeah that, I think that would be would be a concern. Um, so unless unless you're in a free port and you're getting your materials delivered uh, direct on a ship, um, that that <laughs> that's only going to make things worse, isn't it? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think that that finishes us for for the questions and if we don't have any more i would like again to to reiterate my convey my thanks to to lisa sean and um and dominic and also for for morris attending this evening and and the support of always for um engineers island hq in dublin uh, through uh, maureen um, it's been a pleasure to have the three of you, and I and really, really appreciate your support and and in the GB's attempts to uh, to um, to provide 
good speakers for, for this uh, Brexit lecture series. Morris, is there anything you'd like to, to close out on? Uh, no, thank you, Jeff. Um, great talk, and uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that the, the attendees will have enjoyed that. Uh, very good speakers, and uh, I don't know how you did it, but uh, it really felt like you were in one room and you were sort of looking over back at each other. It, it was a terrific uh, coordination across three screens. So I, I enjoyed the event, and I hope everybody else did. And thank you again for organizing it. Perfect. All right, and with that, I will uh, close proceedings and, and thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all.